You are listening to the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast. Welcome to the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast. I'm your host, Tim Hampton. My Unusually Well-Informed guest today is Joe Justice. Joe is the author of the book titled Scrum Master, published in seven languages. Joe has worked with Bill Gates, the leadership team at Amazon, and operated the Agile program at Tesla for Elon Musk. Joe founded Wikispeed, which became an example of fast and agile automotive design and production in a fun, egalitarian culture. Today, Joe and I are discussing the secrets to the amazing pace of innovation at Tesla. Joe, welcome to the show. Tim, it is my honor and privilege to rock with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. So let me start with talking a little bit about Elon the man um, and how he approaches his day. Ashley Vance was, uh, he did a, first of all, he did, I think the first uh, bio book on Elon Musk and he was at a Reddit AMA and he was asked, uh, what is a typical day for Elon Musk? And he said, there's really is no typical day for Elon. Elon starts out most days looking to address the critical path, blocking any one of his companies from achieving their goals. So my question to you, Joe, because you've observed Elon Musk at work, is this different than what other leaders do? Yes, to a phenomenal degree. So Bezos recently bought a $500 million yacht, and I don't fault Bezos for that. Uh, That's a whole other topic about whether you think $500 million yachts should exist. That's a whole thing. The point I want to make here is Bezos wants to escape. Bezos's goals are things like let's cruise around, let's cruise around in space in low earth orbit, and let's cruise around in the ocean on this awesome luxury boat. Bezos's dreams seem to be like a Wall Street person's dreams, which is where Bezos got started. Working with Bill Gates, a little bit similar. Bill's philanthropy is awesome. Bill's technical knowledge is, I I actually truly believe, phenomenal. Um, The object-oriented architecture understanding of business Bill Gates has is, is, I think, through the roof. Bill Gates does want to spend Bill's times at film festivals. And talking to interesting people, having stimulating conversations. Elon wants to spend Elon's time on the critical path for Elon's companies. If Elon has another billion dollars, Elon doesn't buy a boat. Elon doesn't make a a massive house inside a hill in Medina, Washington, like Bill Gates did with bronze statues of Bill and his family sticking up out of the ocean. Bill spends that money on the critical path of Elon's companies. Right. Elon has had many marriages, some to the same lady over and over as they tried to figure the best course forward out for each other. And so I don't think it's like Elon doesn't understand love, romance, attraction. But Elon said it better than I could. He tweeted, look, I'm spending up to five hours a week with this woman. What do they want? And <laughs> that shows the prioritization. It's right. not, I want to succeed so I can spend more time with my wife, my family, my anything. It's the critical path to expanding the light of consciousness in the world is a hard road to hoe, but it is what Elon chooses to do, period. He's not trying to make the company win so he can do something else. Right. Okay. So let's talk about some of the ways he goes about things. Um he refers to first principles often. So the idea that you should break things down to their truest cause and and not make assumptions on the way up. And he's even gone so far as to say, I don't believe in process, which is a contentious statement for a lot of people who make a living either applying processes or sharing processes. Um, But he is clearly applying many of the principles that that are supporting um, processes. Design thinking, lean startup, um, agile. You can see the tool marks, right, on on the things he's producing. Um, How can we learn from Elon's approach if it doesn't even have a name? (laughs) Yeah, right. Um, 
I, I think that is a problem. Having an intelligent conversation about it is difficult. But as soon as anyone says this is the Musk method, which I am so tempted to do, it even sounds good. Mm -hmm. It's can you really pin it down? You can say here are the Musk principles, which people do. But the Musk method is so flexible. So a snapshot of it in time is something that I teach. I call it group agile. But that's a snapshot in time. That's when I was in the company. And already that's a year ago. Right. So it, it's it, Musk evolves methods super fast as well. But a principle here is, I think, related to what I was trying to say before, is Musk is there. Musk is present. I never saw a single presentation or made a single presentation while I worked at Tesla. There was never a meeting where I was sitting. There were group work sessions. And I guess if that's what you call a meeting, then everything was meetings. But I was never sitting around a table and talking ever hmm. the entire time I was in the company. People just work on the critical path, period. And they might talk about it while they're working. That's it. And the reason that's true is because Musk is working on the critical path. So it's not like you get off the critical path to make a presentation to anyone. Because Musk is on the critical path. So the only way to collaborate is if you are also working on the critical path. So uh, let me quote a Stanford professor. It's usually safe to do that. Uh, his name is Robert Bergelman. And he said that successful firms are characterized by maintaining bottom-up internal experimentation and selection processes while simultaneously maintaining top-driven strategic intent. It seems like that's something that is truly going on within SpaceX and Tesla. Do you see evidence of that going on? Maybe it's even a little weirder than that. Um, it, it, the effect of that is what I believe I experienced and got to be a part of, but how that was executed, I think is different. The companies are basically flat. There is not really the concept of a top there is someone working or a group of people working on a given area and they probably know the most about it because they are the ones working on it now. And they then drive innovation as do you, if you join them, but there's not really a top. And I would like to call Elon the flat emperor and the reason I say that is because if Elon were not paying for everyone, this wouldn't happen. So there has to be a top mm -hmm. in quotes, in air quotes, a top, someone who's paying everyone. And if they choose to make it flat, innovation can be super fast. And Elon chooses to make it flat. And I believe the only way it can be truly flat is if the person who's paying for everyone is working shoulder to shoulder, elbow to elbow with everyone else and sweats the details, not micromanaging, doing it. And that I think is the difference between most investor led companies or board and board above the board supported companies is there's a detached layer you have to present to, to get permission. And that introduces a delay. It is fundamentally structurally slower. So that's really interesting. The way you phrase that, that um, I'll, I'll paraphrase it. Cause I thought I understood the meaning, but I don't remember the words. So basically, Elon is there working alongside, but he's not micromanaging. You use the word micromanage. And the, the difference between micromanaging and what Elon's doing, at least based on reputation, what you hear about him being there and people even saying, even people who aren't necessarily happy with him, saying, you know, he came down and contributed something that helped us break a log jam. So he's really contributing. He's not saying, what are you guys doing? He's saying, what are we doing? Which is very different. Um, but there are people who, who, uh, a lot of lean people even are like, no, there, there needs to, you can't be for the, for higher management. The Gemba is not the production line. It's, it's somewhere else. You're just meddling right now. Right. So let's get into some of the feedback from the lean community because the lean community, and I think it was before you were working at Tesla things were bad, right? Um, it was production hell in 2018, I think was the zenith of that. And you joined after 2018, right? So a lot of people in the lean community, which of course is a descendant of Toyota and Toyota production system, they were all stroking their beards going, Elon doesn't know what he's doing. It's chaos. 
And if I may, I'll quote you something from, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Jim Morgan, but he's senior advisor at the Lean Enterprise Institute. So kind of a big wheel in the lean community. And in 2018, he contrasted TPS with production hell at Tesla. And I I promise you, I'm setting the table for something that I'd like your opinion on. TPS is an incredibly powerful manufacturing system, referring to the Toyota production system. But once you are at launch, your tools, fixtures, processes, part designs, interfaces, and requirements, they are all done. The front end of the development process is where the rapid learning cycles through targeted experimentation should take place, not during launch, let alone during production. So that it's a waterfall process that they're describing, right? You design the product to perfection, and then you design the production line to perfection, and then you get underway. And this is the complete opposite of what Elon did. Can you comment on why that worked anyway? (laughs) So the the authors of the modern waterfall process, I don't know how nerdy we should get here or not. I mean, I don't know what- Do it. Lay it on me. Um, That's a, a, a pair of authors from DuPont Chemical called Oganaki and Ray. And they wrote the book, I think it's called On Process Design, it's similar, similar title, Oganaki and Ray are the authors, they were the process leads at DuPont Chemical, that is the modern waterfall process. And their words for when this applies are any time where you know the solution in advance, and there's less than 4% variance during the life of the project and process. If there is more than 4% variance during the life of the project or process, or you don't know the solution in advance, you would instead need an inspect and adapt approach or an empirical process control. And Musk wants rapid innovation, which by definition is more than 4% variance. <laughs> the, if the acceleration on any of the cars or the safety or the range or the ease of use could improve more than 4% in the shortest length of time possible, that would be desirable. So you can't use a plan up front process if you desire this, according to the authors of the process, uh, arguably. Oganaki and Ray are widely cited as the authors. So what that leaves us with is an inspect and adapt or empirical process control, which means you rewrite any standard operating procedures as fast as possible. Now, Tesla is awesome. They've actually transcended, in most cases, standard operating procedures. And the only reason you can do that is if you have automated tests on extremely fast feedback loop. And that's what Musk invested in. It's basically DevOps, really good, automated, self-learning DevOps in hardware. What that lets you do is have a test and learn approach in production. Now, Toyota currently can't. That level of automated test doesn't exist. Toyota has a multi-year test phase to ensure high quality. And arguably, it's awesome. Mm -hmm. Toyota products, Lexus products, Toyota family products, Daihatsu, the quality is arguably really high. At the exchange of speed of innovation, because it's not a fast feedback automated system that you can try different processes. Instead, it's a very lengthy test phase that then locks in standard operating procedures, most of them where you're allowed to innovate are areas that won't affect quality. Things like where you stack your bolts, things like queuing points, which is cool. And that's lean in production flow. And that's still good. And Toyota's really skillful at that. Musk can't bet that way if Musk wants fast innovation. So Musk doesn't. Musk is not an agilist. Musk's goal is not following the Agile Manifesto or any of the Scrum frameworks or Agile frameworks. That said, most of them work great in Tesla because Musk wants short cycles of new product development, massive, if possible, increase in value and efficiency per iteration and a maximum of iterations. What Musk says, and I'm completely on board with this, is pace of innovation is all that matters in the long run, which is the antithesis of conventional lean. Now that said, lean is catching up and getting good at figuring out how to work in faster and faster cycles. So I don't think lean is dead or anything like this, but the idea of a phase is dead if you want to be like Tesla. Yeah. And I think it's especially true when, you know, you're not just making the next generation of Corolla, you're making an EV, the first EV that was produced over a hundred thousand of them. 
uh, you're going to have, you're going to learn lessons along the way. I think that was, if, if we had to bake in the design up front, you wouldn't have a lot of the features that are in the car right now. And, That's and, sure. and the only way you can bring down the price of the vehicles, if the battery is more efficient, the motor is more efficient. And, and so, yeah. And that's why they're not losing money on cars anymore. <laughs> right. They're, well, they're built, they're built, improving Tesla, their margins. Arguably Tesla is never losing money on cars, but it depends where you measure. Right. So the Musk model of financing is something I super respect. Cost of the product is 20% over cost to create trying to factor out dynamically labor cost, material cost, vendor cost, trying to amortize that per unit that day. Cost per unit plus 20%. Then 19 of that 20% is put into making the product higher value, more fun, faster, lower cost to manufacture. So Musk attempts to always have approximately 1% profit. And in the very long run, that wins. Now, bizarrely, that's similar to what Musk did at PayPal too. And if you're playing a really long game, you win. Musk wanted to super disrupt banking and finance, which starting to try to again. And the rest of the PayPal significant shareholders and influencers and people with voting rights said, look, we've made enough money, just stop. And they kicked <laughs> We want an eBay moment. <laughs> yeah. And um, this is why I think Musk's method can't survive unless the person who wants the innovation has majority voting rights. Mm. So I don't think it actually can work in Volkswagen or Toyota unless the Pierce family wants it in Volkswagen's case, or unless the Japanese government wants it in Toyota's case. Um, but it can work when you have a person who wants the innovation as the person funding it directly, not accountable in mass to others. So, um, when you, I've, I've seen you refer to the way, uh, certainly Bill Gates works, um, as, as dividing the, you, you even talked about object orientation, right? It's this idea that we want to break up the problem into small pieces so that parallel teams can work on it. Jeff Bezos is like two pizza teams, which if I don't know how much you can eat, that's two people in my book, but anyway, let's say 10 people. Um, it's a small group of people that, that are allowed to focus independently of what's going on because there's, there's clearly defined um, interfaces between what you're doing, what other people are doing. But then you have situations, um, and if I may invoke somebody by the name of Justice, there's Justice's Law. And I want to get this right because I'll probably hear from the guy. The modules of the project create the structure of the company. Did I get that close? It's totally it. Yeah. Okay. It, it's, uh, I used to call it reverse Conway's law. Yes. Um, I've I, heard of Conway's I, law. I, yeah. I, Conway's law is 1967. And that's saying, looking at the product, you can basically back calculate the way people communicate in the company. Mm -hmm. And so I proposed a reverse of that. I used to call it reverse Conway's law. And then I realized I wasn't getting cited. So I thought, <laughs> all right, I better name it after me. If, if I want anyone to know where to get more information like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll put it in the show notes. Now you're very but, kind, Tim. <laughs> but what I but what I want to get at with that is um, the thing about Tesla is that it's very dynamic in that sense. You know, uh, it doesn't have uh, a, 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 a transmission division and uh, uh, an, a motor division. It doesn't have an HVAC division, and and so you wind up with very clever. Uh, initiatives that couldn't happen if the company was broken into pieces. And I don't know how familiar you are with the super bottle and the octa valve, but they're a perfect example of the kind of being able to transcend silos. Can you talk a little bit about that? How that would work in an agile environment? So this is something none of the current agile frameworks propose. And I, I think this is what, what I'll try to call group agile which is basically a snapshot in time of the Musk method, um, if there is such a thing, uh, what it's trying to propose. And that's a concept called open space. Open space was identified as a way to run a conference where you didn't know the agenda in advance. You might have some ideas, you might have some topics you want to be conference tracks, but you don't know all of them in advance, but you know there's a group of people passionate about some theme or topic or something. So they're gonna agree to come to one place at one time and 
any agenda items you do have in advance, you'll have up on the, the agenda wall at the top of the newsroom. And it'll say, in this conference room, this person is going to ask questions or share information about this. So it doesn't even mean they know about it. They're, they're, there's at least one person passionate, so they'll ask questions to whoever shows up. Or maybe they know a lot about it and they'll share, right? So either way, it's fine. You can ask a question or share what you know. Also, here are rooms that are currently empty or empty at these times. Propose anything you want. And this is a dynamic way to create the agenda. Tesla actually runs this way. <laughs> Every time I would show up at work, I would not know what the top priorities or top possibilities are. And I could propose one at any time, as could anyone, no matter what your level. I mean, there aren't really levels. Everyone has similar or identical decision-making rights. So I would come in and there'd be an agenda of here are things like, for example, improve the octo valve could be one of these things. Or I could propose, I was working tangentially near, like I was installing a bunch of octo valves maybe with a team. And I think if we change this, we can have greater efficiency and it'll be easier to install because I find I'm always doing X, Y, and Z and maybe I don't need to be. So I'll propose this. Who would like to join me in this area? And that's any free area. So you end up doing it in the parking lot under a shade or in corners. I mean, remember I was working in the mothership most of the time, Fremont, California. That was a previously a Toyota facility and before that GM. So the bones weren't as modular as any of the more modern Tesla facilities. So we had to work in corners and you know, wherever there, where it was room. Um, and you would then mob. Uh, I have a huge amount of respect for someone named Woody Zool. Woody Zool formalized a really fun way to work as a group called mob. And it can get complicated if you want it to get complicated and you get familiar with all the basics, but on the surface, it's one person, it, it depends how big the work is. And a lot of things, only one person can actively be the top contributor, but you don't want them to work alone. They don't get any innovation ideas from anyone else. There's no one to check their work or there's no one to be thinking high level. Are we doing the right thing versus, you know, technically, am I doing it? So how do you get that benefit? Also, then one person has siloed knowledge. What if they get sick or quit or take vacation? So mob, you rotate however many people can physically be contributing. If there's one keyboard, a lot of the time it's digital, or if there's one robot and there's only enough room for you to get your hands in to get it unjammed in this area, when you do lock in, tag out, tag in, tag out. I mean, these are robots. You have to pull a <laughs> Good, <safety>. Yeah. <laughs> no Captain <laughs> um, Kirk moments. Dude, not even. <laughs> like, safety is super serious. Uh, it, but not at the expense of speed. So there's all this work to optimize fast safety. It's really thrilling. So you're there and then a timer will go up and uh, someone will rotate with you. And now you're giving them advice while they do it. And then a timer will go off and you, and you switch. And that can go through up to six people and still feel dynamic and exciting and still be high quality. Or, you know, a pair could do it. Sometimes there's room for two people to work at once and it's two drivers, right? Well, there's even more roles, driver, navigator, and many more if you get really comfortable with it. And Woody Zool made it basically a game and it works awesome. And this is the fundamental snapshot of what I experienced or what I'm aware of, what I've been able to process so far when I was running Agile at Tesla in 2020 is the agenda is dynamic. It's very similar to open space. We didn't call it open space, but if you're learning open space, you're on exactly the right track. That's what I experienced. And then mob. And so you mob around an open space agenda item. So for example, octo valve, mm -hmm. and that's fully dynamic per shift. Another aspect that connects in this super well is the idea you own nothing. It's all group ownership. And what drives that home is when your shift ends, no matter what you were doing, someone else comes in and you physically hand them the tools you were working on. You don't own any tools and you know when you come back, it's going to be different than it is now. And so nothing stops with you. It is all 24-7, 365. And that's enforced by, by really the 12-hour the shifts. Now, 12 hours are difficult. They're not for every type of fitness, 
I'm extremely fit. It was difficult. You can actually achieve the same end goal with four six hour shifts, which is shared ownership and around the clock development and the concept of no individual ownership where work stops when you leave. So you don't have to do 12 hour shifts, but 12 hour shifts is one of the very efficient ways to do it. Well, sometimes I think about Elon Musk this way. I mean, you would think that uh, he would prefer to have three Elon Musks working a normal week, but there's, it helps if you have the continuity to keep all the ideas in your head. And that raises a, a potential challenge when you do the handover. Um, when you talked about using four six-hour shifts or maybe four eight-hour shifts, so there's an overlap. I can sort of say, while I'm handing you the tools, let me tell you what this octovalve is about. What we're trying to do yeah. here. Is there time for that? Yes, exactly. And the more, I mean, your goal is to make the work self-explanatory. And there's a lot of tools to help that happen. Um, but there's, especially when a project is a new concept, that's not true yet, at least. Mm -hmm. And some stuff is just still not as walk up simple as you want, but there is a huge encouragement and support for making things walk up simple, but some stuff isn't yet, or some stuff still isn't. So when that happens, yes, you, as you hand the tool, you explain to the level until they can take stuff from the definition of ready to the definition of done until they can advance the problem. Right. And they'll tell you when that's true. But a lot of stuff is walk up simple. There are many, many times I would simply hand the tool and pass each other two ships in the night almost. The, the terms you just used there, definition of ready and definition of done, where do they come from? Are they part of the agile mindset or the lean mindset? How, how does that come about? There are super popular terms that are widely used. The Agile community loves them so much, they've built them into an activity called uh, product backlog refinement. And a lot of companies do that 15 minutes every day uh, per shift. Um, there's no set time amount, even in the rigid Scrum framework. Uh, but in any case, yeah, refinement or grooming as an idea is let's take something that's not yet ready. We don't understand how to add value to it yet and experiment until we figure out how to add value to it. And now it's ready. Okay. Now, once it's ready, we add value to it until it checks off our quality lists. It's sold, or at least it's ready for the next step. You know, if we're making a heat pump, it's ready for install. Um, it, so it, am, I, our quality. am I misinterpreting that then? Because what you, what you just described is a little different than what I had in my mind's eye, which could be completely incorrect. But when you when you say to when you say to the production line, hey, we've got this octoval, we want to replace a lot of the thermal management systems in the car, that you need some sort of interface to count on to say what you were about to do installing thermal management stuff, we're going to do instead with the octovalve. And then between here and here, everything that used to happen can happen and everything that will happen afterwards can happen. Is there something similar in that process? Well, wow. Okay. The octave valve is a pretty awesome example, but it, in a way it's also one of the. It's an outlier. I know. No, it's not an outlier, but it, it's a less simple example. Okay. So if we're making a suspension, like mm -hmm. a yeah, suspension system that swaps in and out with an interface to the chassis, to the body and white, to the frame. And that can be updated anytime anywhere by anybody, even suppliers can make updates to that. And uh, the interface, as long as that matches, just goes. Also, a much more interesting and common occurrence is something spans what used to be an interface all the way to a next interface. That's interesting, yes. When And then the octave valve is a case of that. It, it, it deleted it simplified dramatically a bunch of subsystems they're all just poof, no longer the higher value choice in a case like that you don't well typically you don't explain to the next group here's how you work with this new thing here's how i just changed your world instead you have a new product introduction line an npi line an agile line and you take a car all the way to definition of done, a whole car. 
So you learn from other people, you, you have them help incorporating the octo valve, for example. And now there is one car with this innovation sold. It's out there being driven. If it met the definition of done, if it on the bamboo line passed all tests, it's sellable. So it is. And now you have analytics coming back and there's just one of them, right? And it's your job. Okay, can we make two tomorrow? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> can, can we make three? And then production toggles over to that MPI line, at least for that, uh, up until your next new interface. So instead of retraining the other group, you, you, you have multiple versions in production at the same time, and it's dynamically toggled. That's what's called the production ramp. And I think when Musk talks about the production ramp, most people don't understand it's multiple versions in parallel and it never ends. So production hell will never end. And by the way, traditional manufacturing of all types, I I worked in Toyota, I've worked in, I've worked with Nissan, um, I've worked with Bros and Bosch and Daimler and Volkswagen. They all have production hell, but it's typically during a plant shutdown period that's many months long, sometimes more than a year long. Mm -hmm. And it's not while they're attempting to be in production. Um, but it's just as crazy. It's just as stressful. And yeah, the just Ford as Explorer much as- was, yeah. uh, was behind schedule. I mean, the Ford Explorer is a beautiful car as far as I'm concerned, but it, it didn't come out of the gate very well with their version of production. How did it? There's always reality. Yeah. The chip shortage now is a wonderful test mm-hmm. of agility. Yes. Company that had difficulty switching to a different chip had to idle production. Companies that could switch to a new chip and download new firmware in it in two weeks, only one, Tesla. What that means is Tesla's sale numbers went up. All other companies that were competing, sale numbers went down. Mm -hmm. And that is the test, that is the validation of a company that can change where capital is deployed efficiently, quickly, an agile company. One of the beautiful things about Agile um, or, or about software, which is why Agile works so well with software, is you can usually test and see what's going to happen with your software really quickly and inexpensively. You kind of have to rely on real life to test your cars. And you have to know which version of all the different things you've tried is going on inside of that car. What, what version of this car, you know, what suspension does it have? Does it have the octo valve? Does it have this airbag? And so the concept of digital twins becomes really important. Can you expand on how that has an impact? Absolutely. Uh, So Toyota does still track cars with paper, actual printed paper physically, and or they did last time I was there. What that means is you want to track cars by batch from in, in, in big batches. You want fewer batches. So it's easier to track. It's easier to process and say, from this date to this date, all of these cars had this version of the ball joint. All of these cars had this adhesive. All of these cars had this batch from this supplier. If you're tracking by paper, that's essentially the only way. If you track each vehicle digitally automatically, if you could, if you had a automated system that would, without human, without waiting on a human, track each vehicle independently, including the parts that make it up and even try to track when did it get changed? Do we think it was modified or was it maintained or what's its current service life? How's it being driven now? If you could do that, you could have a digital twin per vehicle. Well, this is exactly what Facebook does for all Facebook users. Who are your friends? What do you like? Do you use a phone or laptop? What kind of phone? What kind of laptop? What phone or laptop did you use before? What kind of phone or laptop do your friends use? What do you like to buy? Do we think, you know, Facebook does that. So does Twitter, so does Zing, Uh, Twitter, not quite aggressively, but so does anything with a sign in. Now, Tesla does that per car, and that's a standard digital concept now. And Tesla is a digital native, Silicon Valley native company. Of course, that's not a challenge. That's a digital native company. This is what companies are talking about or should be talking about when they say digitalization, moving from batch tracking 
human in the loop tracking or waiting on a human in the loop tracking, a paper tracking to automated digital human not in the loop. It happens whether you're there to press the button or not. With that, it's now, that is one of the gating technologies that allows each of the 2 million Teslas on the road to potentially be unique. The -hmm. other is that you test fully for road legal validation every single car. That's incredible. And that, um, because you have mentioned that before, is this idea that because each car is unique, each car is basically homologated independently, which blows my mind, not because Tesla's doing it, but because the authorities are doing it. You even described that the 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 people who certify cars are there at, at talk about Bamboo Road and what that experience is like. Yeah, the, uh, the Bamboo Line. Bamboo um, Line. You know what? Bamboo Road sounds more fun. Maybe, it does. Maybe, the, maybe the name is up for a, for a, for a Kaizen. Oh, well, I'll look, I'll look, I'll race you to GoDaddy after the show. <laughs> Genius. Genius. Um, autopilot originally was factory mode. The idea of the, the bamboo line is that each car puts itself through all road legal tests and the gating authorities, the government bodies, they in general don't want to hold up innovation. That's not their wish. Their wish is that you demonstrate safety and compliance right. with Title 49 uh, the code of federal regulations and related subsections for safety and road legal uh, and, and interoperability with the known stable interface that is the surface road network in North America. I mean, it, it actually all comes down to interfaces, interestingly. And the containerization movement of transport is a wonderful example of known stable interfaces. So you have the code of federal regulations as your known testing base. And that's published. It's Mm -hmm. publicly accessible law. So you know what the targets are. And if any company can demonstrate compliance, however fast they can do that is fine. The government organizations aren't saying, prove it to me slowly. (laughs) The government organizations are saying, prove it to me responsibly. And for the most part, they're happy to be quick if it's valid and proven. If I walk into someone's office and they have a hundred questions for me and I have to wait and think and then leave to go get answers to some and come back. That exchange could take months. And that is a typical homologation process. Whereas if I come in with a hundred answers already in the format that they, that they like, because I've learned what they like by doing fast iterations with them, it's as fast as it takes for them to read it. And in general, that's homologation. Okay, that's fascinating. So it's it's almost like those times when you go to the doctor's office and they're like, "Can you fill this out?" And you got to do the hand scratching with the pen, and you wonder who who's who, how many sick people have touched this pen. But you could be doing, and a lot of them are doing this in advance now, where you fill out a form, you type it all in, you can do it really quickly, and potentially it could even be reused. Yeah, so I, I can see the advantage of that, and the digital twin knows all of that. It knows how the headlights are pointed. It knows the design of the taillights every rule, you can tick it off. I love it. Um, Talk to me more about this connection between autopilot and factory mode, because I'm one of the people who's excited to hear about that, because you would think you could send the car whipping around on its own on a torture track, and you wouldn't even have to pay somebody to sit in it. Fact. That's what's happening. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Tesla's very early days. That was the comment on Twitter. Thank you. They were saying, there's no way autopilot came from factory mode. I don't know what data that person has. That's exactly what happened. Autopilot Mm -hmm. came from factory mode. In fact, it came as a freebie. Um, And Musk publicly cited this. There's a lot of stuff I wish I could talk about and I I don't get to yet. I haven't seen anyone publicly talk about it yet. And I do have a non-disclosure. But the topics that we're engaging on are all ones that someone has already talked about at least the parts I'm talking about. Good. So this is one Musk said. Musk said, well, first Musk did a factory tour where he showed the bamboo line and factory mode. This was in the earliest days of Model S when it was still a body in white and they were just figuring out how to start to produce that as a car, uh, largely with Daimler and Bosch's support at that time, which right. Elon thanks Daimler and Bosch many times. He's saying at that time, 
their engagement was critical. And it's true, they, they were heavily involved in the Model S at that time in, in figuring it out in its ramp. And factory mode was Tesla's weird Silicon Valley, I can't believe they're spending so much inordinate time and effort so the car can drive itself through road legalization tests. They're only gonna do that once every seven years. Why automate that? That's so weird, right? Well, but a software mind would of course say, of course I want automated testing so I can try new ideas as fast as possible. So there's factory mode, publicly citable. You can see it in the earliest factory tour videos since the Model S. I don't know about the Roadster because I was not in the company until 2020. I don't know about the Roadster doing, original Roadster doing automated tests or not. It's publicly referenceable already in the earliest times of Model S. Then autopilot came later in its very first versions and Musk talks about the genesis of that. A driver of a Model S fell asleep at the wheel and struck a bicyclist. And they, they actually even tried to sue Tesla saying the new car smell put them to sleep. They lost the lawsuit. You no, know, they're like, you fell asleep at the wheel. You were an irresponsible driver. Yeah. Um, it, was a, it was dismissed as a frivolous lawsuit. It, it, Tesla was, their hands were washed of it legally. In Tesla though, this is how truly awesome the company is. Like you can think most companies, they'd be like, oh, we're being attacked for something. It's not our fault. In Tesla, the response was immediately, what can we do to make this less likely in the future that a bicyclist would get hit? Not that a suit will be filed, not that a frivolous suit will be piled, filed, that our cars could hit a bicyclist. Is there a way to responsibly reduce that risk? This is how absolutely phenomenal the company is. Amazing. And this becomes one of those agenda items that people can use the law of two feet are my two feet in the spot where I'm contributing the highest value right now? Yes or no? You can use the law of two feet and take you to one of these initiatives. One of those initiatives was, can we make a version of autopilot of factory mode that already helps dynamically sense some types of obstacles as it's going through automated testing? Can we make a branch of factory mode that could reduce the likelihood of hitting a bicyclist even if the driver falls asleep? And that, was autopilot version one. And it, it, was, it was an accidental offshoot value add of the massive effort. That's how serious Tesla is about automated testing. Imagine all the effort of the autopilot stack just on that, because that's how important it is. It is the fundamental gate to the pace of innovation. Amazing. So when, when you try to task thousands of people in an organization around the priorities of the organization, you need some sort of way to disseminate what the priorities are. And an example I saw from SpaceX, Gwynne Shotwell was walking through the factory and they happened to walk past a large display that had a graphic of how many, how many of the uh, rocket engines had been installed on the rocket they were working on as a visual reminder of what it is you're aiming for and how important it is and how much progress we're making. I understand that there's something similar going on at Tesla. Can you describe how people are, are kept in the loop on what they need to be focusing on? One of, one of my first days in the company, I, I walk in as a brand new hire and first you go through a four hour orientation or that's what it was when I joined and apps are downloaded into your phone that give you that visibility. But you're learning how to navigate those and seeing these real-time graphics, what are they? And I was told, like everyone, when I was hired, you are empowered, you can do anything, you can talk to Elon. If you see an opportunity to improve the situation, it's your job. Don't wait on anyone else, go do it yourself. It doesn't matter if it's in another department, there aren't really departments, but they say that, or if they're your boss or boss's boss, there aren't really bosses. But it, so it, it encourages you to, to understand you are fully empowered, you have decision-making rights. Well, I wanted to know, is this real or is this hype? I wanted it to be true. So I walked into the top of the office, there is kind of an office structure. It's sort of like an aircraft control tower type thing in the part of the factory I was in right now and looked at all the monitors on the wall. And it's just like what you're describing. And they were the same as the ones on my phone. And they were the same in the area where I was. There was no different hidden information period. And I had just been hired. There's full transparency of all operations everywhere. And through your phone, you can like 
teleport like to anywhere to see where is the critical chain being blocked? What is the critical chain? Learn what the critical chain is. Where is it being blocked? And you can then mob or swarm on wherever it's being blocked or learn from one of the parts that have slack if you're tired that day, you know? And so I'll go there and I'll rotate through their pairs because they're still operating. They're just not the critical bottleneck. So they still need people and I still need to learn that. So what's fascinating about that is it's giving it's giving people on the line the ability to do the exact same thing Elon's doing, which is looking for the biggest problem to solve. I love that. There is a empowerment wise no difference between being Elon and being anyone that Elon's deciding to pay. Mm -hmm. um, Tesla and SpaceX are largely an experiment in universal basic income, and your real pay is stock. So there's no ladder to climb. <laughs> like you're there. <laughs> Do the most awesome thing you can. You are basically Elon if you want to be from the moment you're hired. Hmm. So I'm going to do an experiment. Um, we talked before the show about something, and I don't even know if I'm pronouncing, pronouncing this correctly, but a Kinevin. Um, and I'd like to try and share it on my screen because I think it needs a little bit. I'd like to set the table a little bit. So I'm going to try uh, sharing. Here we go. Uh, of course, my screen. There we go. Boom. How does that I look? Are you, are you able to see the Kinevin? I see it. Yeah. Okay. So why don't you walk me through a little bit because I know that you're interested in this model as well. What, what is the purpose of this model? What is it trying to accomplish? Okay, so Cognitive Edge Consulting is this company that proposed this Welsh word, which, which I do believe is pronounced something similar to Kinevin. And the idea is you have a five state model. Um, there's four that are clearly labeled here and there, there's a, a fifth state, a five state model of is the bottle, well, okay, is the situation obvious, complicated, complex, or chaotic? In a company like Tesla, what you're interested in is knowing is the bottleneck to the critical chain, is the bottleneck obvious, complicated, complex, or chaotic? And what the Kinevin model uh, proposes is the most effective plan of attack is likely quite different depending on if the problem is in one of these four categories. Beautiful. So if you are a person that has a very effective method, but you keep hitting a glass ceiling you perceive in your work or your capability or your job, it may be because you're applying one of these tools very effectively, but you come across problems from two or even all four of these types. So your, your solution set isn't matching. Um, Chapter five of my book, Scrum Master, which is now in seven languages, is on this and how your, your agile board, your agile team board changes in flow and how the contents of it, your to-do list, your product backlog changes to take advantage. Well, first to find out is your problem one of these four types and then to have the maximum speed of exploit of improvement uh, depending on the, the, the type here. So let's, uh, I, re I recognize this is playing into stereotypes a little bit, but so HR and finance to me would very much prefer to be in the obvious uh, quadrant here. There's a rule for everything. And if there isn't a rule, somebody's not doing their job, right? That's kind of the mindset. But you've described a very different world for HR and finance within Tesla. How is that organized? Um. HR, if you can, well, it depends what you need HR to do. HR is often used for, in any company, for uh, career pathing. Are you on a path to go where you feel respected and uh, building skill and ability to contribute in the company and to resolve conflict uh, at, at the highest escalation? You know, if you're if you couldn't handle it in your group and the larger group couldn't handle it and these two people really just don't get along or whatever the issue, then it would go to HR for, for resolution. Those two areas are prime examples of what most companies would use HR to do. The first, career pathing, career paths don't really exist in Tesla. There are job descriptions 
to hire people so you understand your skill set is valid and appreciated. But once you're in Tesla, you are employee and you go to do anything, right? And there's not like, really, there's not really sergeant employee and general employee. I mean, you're just, you're in the company doing the most awesome you can and everyone gets paid roughly the same and your real return is stock. Um, so career pathing is a non, almost a non-concept. It's less of a concept. So what about the other one? HR still absolutely exists to do that. Hopefully humans can be civil, but we all have really bad days. Out of a hundred days, one of them was your worst day in a hundred days. Sure. And sometimes that overlaps with someone else's worth day in a hundred days. And it really is not, it doesn't mean you're not in general, pretty good people, <laughs> but this can happen. And HR still exists for that. And now the nature of those problems could be anything. So HR has no idea what landmine <laughs> is going on, right? And the HR, Tesla HR proactively posits policies, which, which you can see very visibly. Like there was one about um, racial slurs mm. and Tesla HR posted this publicly so well, I thought. It was um, regained terms, I think is the word. So you call someone by racial, racial slur, but like a compliment, you're regaining that word and gaining power from it, creating community. And that is one of the potentially valid uses. That's the phrase that Tesla HR chose to use. I thought that was very enlightened, I, I thought. Mm -hmm. So they're saying these regained terms that previously had constrained and been derogatory. Now you're using it as a defense or even overthrowing, transcending the, the constrained and derogatory. They're still complicated and people have mixed feelings. As a result, we don't have time. We're focused on the mission. There's no tolerance for regained terms in Tesla. Don't use them, period. Uh, and, and you'll be immediately accountable if you do. Yeah. So what Tesla is doing is establishing a known stable interface, a very clear one. Even if it's heavy handed, it's a it potentially it's at least clear. So people know how much of themselves they can bring to work. And yeah. They're like, not that part. It's too complicated. Emotions are charged, can be charged. That has zero place here. It will not be tolerated. End of sentence. So now you have your known stable interface is how to contribute. It's, it's gravity. We're all going to work on the floor today, right? Like we, <laughs> there's no, we, you don't need to come into work wondering what surface to work on. Um, so production hell coming back to the Kinevin um, and let me share it again. I don't know. I don't know why this is fighting. Did that work? There we go. Um, it strikes me that during production hell, Tesla was in chaos. It was chaotic. And let me bounce a theory off you and you, you tell me if, it was, if it's working for you. It, chaotic, chaotic to me. So obvious is when you just get in your car and you go to work and you don't have to think at all. Complicated is when you need your GPS because you're going somewhere new. Complex is when it, there's storms and construction and you have to go a little bit of, and find out if that works. And if not, back up and try a different way. Chaotic is when the Tyrannosaurus Rex is trying to tr crush your Jeep. And under those circumstances, you don't say, hey, you know, it'd be good. This would be a great learning opportunity for Fred, who doesn't know how to drive. Let's put him in the driver's seat. You, you push him out of the way and you say, I'm driving. I'm Elon Musk. I, I just, we need, just need to go. And so a lot of what we've seen that people criticize Elon Musk for is very specific to that time and circumstance, I think. You, you have sort of said, you led this description of, of the Kinevin by saying that um, you need to identify the circumstance you're in to work effectively. That seems to be an Elon strength. Man, I, I actually think it's simpler than that. Um, I, I actually think it's simpler than that. I actually find the Kinevin framework, I have a lot of respect for Cognitive Edge Consultancy and Dave Snowden. I actually find the Kinevin framework largely unnecessary. And the reason why is a test and learn approach with never less than 20% of are we doing the right thing experiments in the backlog handles all of these situations with a plum. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it ends up having 
practically no difference. It, it's it's a wonderful conversation starter or enjoying to talk about over a whiskey on the factory floor, almost entirely unnecessary. Part of why is because you simply want to be driving towards chaotic as much as possible. You want to be it's driving towards chaotic? chaotic? Yeah. Explain that. I need to hear more about that. Pace of innovation is the only thing that matters in the long run. If you're not at the edge of chaos, you are sub-optimizing the entire area you're around. And if you've fallen into obvious, the company's dying. Sure. And this is what the chip shortage did. So there's this squiggle at the bottom. And, and this is why I think the model is very valid, even though I, I don't actually execute it on the factory floor. But I think it is valid. You can actually absolutely have a valid conversation about it over a whiskey. I just don't think it's necessary. <laughs> the squiggle at the bottom that looks, well, whatever you think it looks like. The concept here is there's a cliff between obvious and chaotic. Mm -hmm. And if a group or a team or a company gets in a habit of obvious work and not executing test and learn, if there is a disruption to their process, they fall off the cliff into chaos yeah. instead of moving into complicated or complex. This is what the chip shortage has done. Other plants simply said, well, let's idle the plant. Obviously our installers, obviously our lines aren't ready to cope with a different chip. We don't have new firmware, our supply chain isn't optimized. We don't have standard operating procedures for it. We don't have union agreements in place to handle the new chip appropriately, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. In a company that always has a certain percentage of every to-do list, I'll call it a backlog. Are we doing the right thing? Should we be doing something different? And you have people who are used to jumping on a different challenge constantly. It's not, this is my job. I'm the person who puts the tape here. It's, I will potentially be drawing CAD today and I'll potentially be loading racks of 20 kilogram parts this afternoon, right? So you're a cross-functional human and you expect that. That's, it's not a drag to do something new that's part of your normal pace. Well, when the chips run out, you say, okay, I will get on the phone, well, on the internet and then the phone and try to figure out what chips have similar pin types. Do any of them have programmability that can offer the same level of functionality? And then I will start programming firmware, even though that's not my forte, until I can find people with a law of two feet that are better at it than me. And then I will rotate with them in a mob. And in two weeks, you have new firmware on the chip because you're used to being at the edge of or in chaos. And this is the effect of the, the cliff. So, and I think another example or family of examples is Blockbuster and Kodak, because at the, at, the, at the obvious phase, you know, this is, we've been doing this for a hundred years and doing it extremely well. And you're not paying attention to your circumstance. And, and then all of a sudden you wind up with no business at all. And that's chaos for you. Um, let me, I know, uh, let's pretend we do have a whiskey. Because it seems like uh, Toyota and the lean community is really focused on the complicated regime. And what I mean by that is it may be complicated. You may need experts to do it. You may need to put your head down and think it through. But we're designing another Corolla. And so we know what we're doing. And so we, we set experts to work. We can count on it taking a couple of years to design the next car. We can count on a year to redo the plant. And, and we know what we're doing. And I, I agree with you that I, I certainly came into this conversation expecting to agree with you on Elon being really um, keen on the complex part because it's all about trying something and seeing what happens. I'm astonished that uh, you would, you would su suggest he continue working in the chaos regime because I thought that was unique to the Model 3 ramp. There is no design phase in Tesla and there's no ramp begin and end. It's there's always design. So there is always ramp and there is always innovation as a result of you hope innovative design. And that means you are always on the edge of chaos and fall into it and come back multiple times a day. Hmm. But didn't, didn't um, other than Germany not getting the permits, it seems like that's going swimmingly. And Texas seems to be going so well. And, and Shanghai went 
incredibly smoothly. It's it 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 seems like, I, but even with the Model Y, they are uh, making. I think it was a Model Y that the Octavel One Ten first, right? So they are iterating within that product line, but it just seemed to go so much more smoothly. I thought maybe we had transcended chaos a little bit. One, I, I think the the chaos of the Model Three is misunderstood, and two, I think the level of sweat to make all these operations work since then is maybe underappreciated. So I'd say the actual, my, my understanding, I was in Tesla in a, in a snapshot of time, but there was a lot of cool stuff happening at that time, some of which I still don't get to talk about. Um, but it looks like same as always. And if you wanna call that production hell, I don't think it ever stopped. But I think what some people think of or say when they thought production hell is not quite what it was. Um, that said, to say that it was a bunch of relaxed people sipping coffee, putting the Octave Alpha in the Model Y, I don't think that's true either. Um, I, it feels a lot like if I had to draw an analogy to, I, I have not served in any nation's armed services. I think it's probably similar to what a lot of nations call special forces, which a lot of other branches of the military will tell you that's actually what everybody does, whether you call it special or not. And that actually might be just as true. But in any case, you are parachuting in to a situation and it's your job to be awesome. And that's every day. And if it's not like that, it means that area is not evolving fast enough. So it's your job to try to find the innovation lever and pull it as hard as you can with a group of people, because it should feel like you, you are driving towards chaos. That is, that is desired. You want to be right on the edge of it. And that comes from models of artificial life and complex adaptive systems and what a lot of us call AI now. The fastest improvement to the model, to its understanding of its situation and its ability to improve is at the edge of chaos that is measured where the maximum improvement happens. That's the desired state. This has been fantastic. And I'm going to try to embrace chaos some more. I just want to ask one last question. Um, Tesla changed its uh, mission statement from uh, accelerating the world's transition to sustainable transport to accelerating the world's transition to sustainable energy. So it expanded its mission, which is rare because usually a mission is like a, a, a generational thing. And here he's like, well, we've pretty much accomplished the first one. Let's make it bigger. And, and that was the transition from the master plan part one to part two, part two, right? It seems like we're on the cusp of a master plan part trois because we've, we've expanded now with the Tesla bot and AI and everything else. It seems like maybe we are headed towards chaos again. What do you see as the uh, coming in part trois? What do you speculate for me as your last thoughts today on what you see Tesla doing in the future? If we close our eyes and say, what's a better future, a brighter future where the light of consciousness is spread out amongst the stars and it's a happy place to be, it's uh, good things. And we imagine what is good probably have different flavors of that vision, but there's likely some commonalities. And that is the backlog for X.com or whatever you want to call the overall conglomeration, conglomeration of Musk's assets. And that's what Musk wants to do with Musk's time. And over Musk's lifetime, unless that's interrupted, I, I hope not, I'm a fan of where this is going, or it's broken up by any trust laws and there's massive government intervention that could happen. If it were to run towards that objective and we work back from that, so this is now standard Toyota thinking, lean thinking, work back from the overlap of what good ultimate future pinnacle consciousness is, whatever that is, a very science fiction conjecture when we have different visions, but the overlap of that, the Venn diagram, what many people share if you work back from that in the leanest number of steps, that's the progression of the master plans. And so one of those is, of course, gasoline and diesel won't work on Mars efficiently. Mm -hmm. So you need something else. And 
so obviously there's going to be moves into construction more than just tunneling. Obviously there's going to be moves into deeper tunneling and habitat and HVAC systems. Musk already said that. Mm -hmm. Whereas VTOL aircraft only works in certain types of air densities right now. Awesome, super cool, sub suboptimum. Neat maybe will happen someday, but only when there's so much progress that niche activities that only work on one planet <laughs> Makes sense. In general, the it's the bottleneck right now towards tonnage into space and then making that tonnage in kilograms more valuable. So it's still a huge emphasis on artificial intelligence stack, or maybe that word is still overused. Machine learning. Sure. Machine learning stack. Um, and then getting humans in the loop. So a lot more on Neuralink as people become more aware of the benefits of the idea and more, I want to say comfortable, but I mean, actually a fan of the right. positivity and as tunneling projects become more advanced, then there's how do you process building materials, structural building materials out of the outfall of the tunneling systems, better permitting systems. Okay. I'm going to conjecture a little further now. Musk is making plays towards currency 2.0, gold 2.0 yeah. and fiat currency, but not fiat, fiat currency replacement. And then also fact checking and truthfulness. And eventually that moves into government. Musk has been talking about that this year. Government is company at the limit. So if government as company at the limit does not break up the Musk companies, antitrust style, Musk companies will at some point become a greater part of everyday life than most governments are and a more valuable, more trusted place would be a good version of that future. And I truly believe that's exactly what Musk is trying to do. Um, so likely not part toi, but later, we'll see more secure voting and voting directly on projects. And there'll likely be projects executed by auto bidder out for anyone. I mean, Musk wants an ecosystem of functional competition in quotes, you know, of other groups doing this. Uh, unfortunately, Musk didn't want to get into electric cars. He's like, no one else is doing this. <laughs> Musk didn't want to get into rockets. He's like, no one else is going to the moon again. Right. So, so if no one else is auto bidding awesome large infrastructure projects, skyscrapers, mass human habitat, wildlife preservation, that's going to be in the master plan, I would conjecture. And then wildlife habitat on not earth to preserve cedar trees, banyan tree forests, microbes, birds, that will likely move into other biospheres. So there's backups of those as well. So you'll likely see something like self-sustaining wetlands habitat, other habitats on other planets. That, that's probably master plan four or five or six. <laughs> I think so, yeah. And for those of you who want a preview, if you read the foundation series, uh, Isaac Asimov. It, it's actually pretty quirky and highly dated, I think. But what it does do is think about humanity over billions of years. And Musk refers to it often. And I think that will give you a very good indication. I, Foundation is also a dystopian novel. Yes. So being some of the dystopia yes. is the master plan. <laughs> Amazing. Well, uh, thank you so much for this journey and, and uh, sharing some of the chaos to come. I do appreciate it. Thank you so much, Joe. My pleasure, Tim. You are awesome. Let's be best friends forever. Thank you very much. My guest today was Joe Justice. Joe's LinkedIn profile will be in the show notes. My name is Tim Hampton, and you can reach me at Tim at unusuallyvolunteformed.com. Thanks for listening. I hope you will subscribe and join me for the next show with another unusually well-informed leader in business and technology. Thank you for listening to the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast. The opinions expressed by the host and guests on the Unusually Well-Informed Podcast are their own and do not reflect that of their employer or any other affiliation. 